In the distance, I heard the words, Shalom, Benjamin. Benjamin, wake up. My eyes opened the moment I was called. The angel of God spoke, My name is Raphael, prophet of God. You know me. I am sent to you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Follow me now. I got up from my bed and followed the messenger angel of God down the stairs, through the door and into the street. We stood still in the middle of the intersection of the street, near our house. The angel of God spoke, The God of Isaac, Jacob and Abraham allows you a glimpse into the future at what will come to pass very soon. The messenger angel of God held in his right hand a sort of golden shepherd's crook and stuck it upright in the ground and spoke, Thus there will be many earthquakes like this one. At the moment that a rod penetrated right through the asphalt, the road began to crack and to vibrate. The ground was moving violently. Simultaneously I heard a trumpet sound which persisted, an all-pervading sound that I could even feel vibrating through my mind, and it filled the airspace as meanwhile all kinds of things took place. I saw as in slow motion all kinds of people in the air, and even babies and people with disabilities, and also animals were going up in the air. I saw dogs and cats and even marmots, large and small animals. All that I was seeing amazed me and went far beyond my understanding. The messenger angel of God spoke further. Benjamin, God is saying the same words as in the days of Noah. Genesis 9 verse 12 And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature with you for all generations. I asked, To whom is this further revealed? The messenger angel of God said, Only to Benjamin, from the tribe of Benjamin. You are truly the prophet of God of the last days. Immediately during the rapture, I saw a kind of lightning which filled the entire sky. I also heard wailing and crying everywhere. The messenger angel of God spoke, Benjamin, it will be just like it is written in Exodus 12, verse 30. There it is written, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Then I said, This I understand, but that there will be a dead. Bli, a heart will have as much grief as with the loss of their loved one. I get it, I said. I saw all sorts of things falling from the sky, a helicopter that uncontrollably circled downwards. Also a plane fell from the sky. I saw fireballs coming down, which struck everywhere, in the roofs and streets. Fires arose everywhere, it looked like a war. Derailed trams and cars with people, but without drivers, crashed into each other. It was complete chaos. I saw several large and small UFOs in the air. They virtually stood still and I said, Look, Raphael! These are the visitors from space. This is what the fallen angels call themselves. I was shocked by rocky stones that fell from the sky. Some were on fire and others were not. They were slightly larger than a football and struck everywhere and caused fire. I also saw all kinds of strange satellites falling from the sky. The messenger angel spoke further and said, Benjamin, fear not, this must yet come to pass. I also felt a kind of magnetic pressure, as if everything was magnetic, as if I was pushed to all sides by some sort of air pressure. Even cars were moved sideways by this pressure. I understood that all this will happen immediately just after the rapture, when Christians have been gathered by God, the God of Isaac, Jacob and Abraham. I saw a blood-red moon which looked badly damaged with holes, where bright light came through it. The sun was shining very bright and the heat was unbearable. 
Also, I heard and saw someone who cursed, but I could not understand it. I think the angel of God had made what he said unintelligible. Then he shouted, irritated and loudly, Rosh Hashanah! The angel of God said, the people will really have hell on earth, for the worst is still to come to those left behind. Benjamin, you have spoken so much on behalf of God, but some people think that you give a study and they don't even see that everything is prophetically foretold and even in the scriptures. But God points out everything is directly spoken to you and everything shall come to pass. I am who I am, thus speaks the God of Israel. I'll bring you back now, Benjamin. And the messenger angel of God said, Repent, you who are listening to this message, and surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and you will be there where your heart, mind, soul, and body are full of. He who does not want to hear will perish. Ruach Yeshu Shalom Emmanuel spoke the messenger angel of God and disappeared. Currently, what's happening right now? We are driving um, in Naisna, and I don't know. I don't want to turn. They want us to turn around. We, we can't go further because um, at least eight people are dead in Cape Town, South Africa, and what is being called, quote, the mother of all storms by South African local media. Four of the victims died in a fire that was caused by lightning, and authorities reported thousands have been evacuated as winds fanned fires and flash flooding hit neighborhoods hard. The rain did bring some relief to the region where drought has been intense. And check this out. High waves churned up sea foam along Cape Town's waterfront. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. tornado whipping through a Canadian town. Take a look at this time-lapse footage capturing the tornado north of Calgary. No one was injured and damage was contained to one rural property. Canada averages just 80 tornadoes per year, so this was pretty rare, while the U.S. reports some 1,300. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control. And he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. Widespread disruption on the island, people trapped in mountainous areas. Heavy rain, which began on Friday, continues to inundate Taiwan with precipitation in some areas reaching 600 millimeters. Thousands of people had to be relocated to temporary shelters. Countless homes have been left without power and water. Hundreds of flights were canceled or delayed, and schools were closed. The losses in the agriculture industry have already reached 660,000 U.S. dollars, leading the price of vegetables to rise 30 percent. 
It's predicted to rise even more. One woman and her grandchild were trapped in the heavy rain. In just a few minutes, the water level rose waist high. Despite holding her grandchild tightly, the two of them couldn't stand still and fell into the water stream. Luckily, a rescue team arrived in time. A torrential rain warning has been issued for six. Luckily, the southwestern airstream is likely to leave on Sunday. But I do want to know what's coming. I used to search for new Nibiru videos every week till I gave up. It was always the same old videos copied or renamed. Our videos with misleading titles and photos offering no proof. Since videos on Nibiru are so disappointing, I decided to make my first documentary video. All you need to know about Nibiru in 10 minutes, 18 months ago. Actually, that is what started the channel you're watching now. Since I am not a scientist nor an alien, there is nothing my video can offer that you cannot find with a thorough web search. However, before my research, if you would have asked me then if I think there is really a planet X, I would have said no. But if you ask me now, my answer will be yes. I believe there is a Nibiru in our solar system. Let me show you why. Originally, I didn't see how a huge planet, four times the size of Jupiter, can exist in our solar system without us knowing. But that is before I learned about TNO. Before I did extensive research on ancient prophecies, which, believe it or not, collaborated somehow. Let me put it this way. You may not recognize Nibiru when it comes, and the visit may be different from what you expected. But believe me, there is a Nibiru out there in our solar system. For people who are new to this Planet X Nibiru theory, big 3600 year orbit, it is called the Destroyer Planet, as when it comes, it will bring destruction and possibly the Doomsday. Wait! If Doomsday comes every 3600 years, how come we're still here? Think about it this way. Many comets pass by our Sun regularly. How many of them hit planets? The last and only one I remember was the Shoemaker-Levy 9 hitting Jupiter in July 1994. So, maybe Nibiru's last flyby was harmless last time. But, we may not be likely so lucky next time. Before jumping to any conclusions we cannot sustain, let me bring you another popular Nibiru theory. The planet Nibiru of Nemesis. Nemesis is supposedly our sun's brown dwarf twin. The theory was first introduced in 1984 largely based on the Earth's mass extension 26 million years cycle. Nibiru twin 1.5 light years away, hidden beyond the Oort cloud would be a perfect suspect. If Nibiru was a planet of Nemesis, it could explain how its occupants survived 3600 years without a sun. Nemesis is Nibiru's travel companion and its portable generator. When the theory was introduced in 1984, it made great sense, and at that time, scientists believed that most stars are binary. Obviously, our Sun should not be an exception. However, scientists have determined that mass extinction happens more like every 50 million years, and two mass astronomical surveys, which ran from 1997 to 2001, failed to detect any brown dwarf in our solar system. While in 2011, NASA's David Morrison, who specializes in near-Earth objects, concluded that even with infrared exist, of course, that is if you believe in what NASA tells you. However, not finding any proof of Nibiru nor Nemesis does not mean they do not exist. Plus, how do you know if you were told the truth? What do you think the government should do if they think the world will end tomorrow? Obviously, telling you will not be on the top of the list. They will build a bunker and plan shelters for people that may survive the Doomsday Earth. And to avoid chaos, it is wise not to share the Doomsday news with anyone. Plus, who can know for certain what will happen, right? If you think the government will always do the right thing, let me tell you what Nostradamus thought about that. 
In Quatrain 227, quote, The divine word will be struck from the sky, one who cannot proceed any further. The secret closed up with the revelation, such that they will march over and ahead. If you have any doubts about Nostradamus's prophecies, check out some of my Nostradamus videos. When I compared his quatrains with historical events, I was shocked to find the unbelievable details revealed. Check out any of my videos and you will Wednesday century. This quatrain seems to indicate that our government would get warnings from the sky, which can be divine, or from aliens. The message warns us, do not proceed. It is a secret that will be kept from most of us. But the warnings were probably ignored as the last sentence stated, quote, such that they will march over and ahead. Whatever the secret may be, it will be ignored, and we, mankind, will eventually face the consequences. So if Nemesis does not exist and Nibiru is only a theory, why should we waste any more time talking about it? Actually, I think Nibiru does exist. It may be different from the mythical planet where Anun Naki reside, but it is there. Let me show you the proof about Nibiru's existence. Consider this, if you think the theory about Nibiru's 3600-year orbit around the Sun is crazy, did you know Mars orbits the Sun every 687 days, but is already considered outside the Goldilocks zone that could harbor lives? What is the chance of life on Nibiru if Nibiru does exist? Plus, what is the chance of having a planet having a 3600-year orbit? The good old days when textbooks told you everything you needed to know is long gone. Now the more we know, the more we know we don't know. For example, when you search on the planet Eris, what you see is that it is called the most massive and second largest dwarf planet known in the solar system. The word known means that we really don't know what we're talking about. Pluto and Eris both are known dwarf planets and Tino, the so-called trans-Neptunian objects, those are minor planets with highly elliptical orbits. And if you search Wikipedia for trans-Neptunian object, a session called Putative Trans-Neptunian Objects of Planetary Size will jump out at you. It states, the existence of trans-Neptunian rock ice bodies of planetary size, ranging from less than Earth mass up to a brown dwarf, has been often postulated for different theoretical reasons to explain several observed or speculated features of the Kuiper Belt or the Oort Cloud. It was recently proposed to use ranging data from the New Horizons spacecraft to constrain the position of such a hypothesized body. Putative means generally considered or reputed to be. Doesn't this sound like an endorsement from Wikipedia? I guess Nibiru is not all BS after all. Another reason I believe planet Nibiru is real is based on what scientists found in 2003. Sedna is a red dwarf no is its crazy orbit. It's aphelion which is the closest distance from the Sun, is 76 AU. But its perihelion is 936 AU. And it takes 11,400 years to complete an orbit. During its 11,400 year journey around the Sun, we can only get a glance when it is near us. So, can you imagine how many more planets we have not seen? Can you imagine how big the others may be? Sedna's discovery proves Nibiru is not a myth. And then we found in 2014 FE72. It is another trans-Neptunian object, but this one has an orbit period of 90,000 years, with a perihelion of 36.3 AU and an aphelion of 4,000 AU. This really pushes our solar system's boundaries far beyond our imagination. 
Then the big question is, why would life choose to grow on a planet so far away from the sun? Well, I guess we don't get to pick our birthplace, right? We have to adapt to our environment, correct? Plus, life may have started on a beautiful, friendly planet till the planet changed. For that, I will share with you another story we are all quite familiar with. The Shoemaker Levy 9. Did you know before Shoemaker Levy 9's impact with Jupiter, it was not orbiting the Sun? That is a fact few people know. The comet Shoemaker Levy 9 was orbiting Jupiter before it got dangerously close and crashed. Two years before impact, Shoemaker Levy 9 was orbiting the Sun. A wrong place at the wrong time changed the comet's path and destiny. So, an advanced civilization may have been flourishing on Nibiru before the planet changed its course. Or maybe Nibiru was pulled away by another star. Maybe it is our sun's binary twin. Its advanced technology made it possible to cope with whatever harsh environment and its residents refused to leave home. Scientists feel the chance of our sun having a twin star is slim. But what gravity forces keep these minor planets circling our sun and something else on these elliptical orbits? There must be another massive body on the other end. Remember, we can only see them when they are close to us. Can you imagine how many more are out there that we have not seen? If the Earth has survived till today, why should we worry? Even if there are a million Nibirus out there, they probably won't come closer than Pluto, right? That may be right, but since we know so little, we have to rely on people who know more. And that is the problem. We have found so many new planets and new stars. Who will know what the next discovery may be? This is Ken Peters. Thank you for watching. Look all around the world at the state of our society and climate. Superstorms like Harvey and Irma crashed into Texas and Florida, smashing rainfall and wind records, and a large 8.1 earthquake in Mexico caused devastating damage. For more than 10 years, our planet's climate has been changing at an alarming rate when compared to geologic records, with increased superstorms, earthquake, and volcanoes worldwide. At the same time, the media focuses our attention away from all of this towards celebrities, icons, and war to divert from the truth. So what really is the truth? As tides around the globe begin receding at a shocking rate, as seen in Florida, Brazil, and Egypt, and large earthquakes and volcanoes increase, we all deserve to know what's really happening and if an outside force is actually to blame for all of this. We must not shy away from this information any longer for a time of great change is upon us that has been written about for thousands of years. To understand what's happening, we must first go back to the earliest developed human civilization on Earth, known as the Sumerians, in what's today known as Iraq. The Sumerians represent the first civilization to develop advanced writing techniques, as well as tracking events and chronicling our ancient history. The Sumerians claimed that their knowledge of the stars, writing, agriculture, and social structures were all lowered from heaven by great gods who came from a planet with a long elliptical orbit known as Planet X, or Nibiru, meaning the crossing. The name Nibiru is derived from the unusual elliptical orbit that the planet follows, which takes it through our central solar system every 3,600 years. The Sumerians left behind records indicating the existence of this planet in cuneiform writings and cylinder seals. The most famous of these is known as VA243, which shows a scale model of our solar system, which includes our central sun and the planets that revolve around it, including Planet X, where they claim their gods came from. Today, most of society has been tricked into believing these gods in Planet X are nothing more than a myth and fairy tale to hide the truth with laughter and ridicule. This clever tactic has hidden the real version of history and our origins for generations until over time has been nearly lost forever. 
It's time for humanity to awaken from its amnesia of all of this happened before us. The Sumerians called their gods the Anunnaki, which meant those who from heaven to earth came. The Sumerians wrote in detail about both who the Anunnaki were and the events that led to their arrival on Earth hundreds of thousands of years ago from Planet X. In these early cuneiform writings, such as the Atrahasis, we learn about two brothers, known as Enki and Enlil, who bitterly fight over the direction of humanity and provides details of the disasters caused by the crossing of Planet X. Much of the turmoil revolves around these two rival families and how this mysterious planet has shaped our story. Enki was a brilliant scientist and was known as the great magician and geneticist of the Anunnaki family. His symbol was represented as a dragon and serpent, and was shown through the modern medical Kedusha symbol. The name En means Lord, with Ki being the original name of our planet before it was called Earth, which was later renamed for this great being Ea, a previous name of Enki. Enki's half-brother Enlil, known as the Lord of the Air or Sky, and represented by the Eagle and Bull was a polar opposite of his brother. His values revolved around a military and highly disciplined mentality, whose interests solely lie in the preservation and future of the Empire of Anu. All of the Anunnaki are named after this king of the gods who believes that he rules over Earth. The oldest and most important of these Sumerian writings is known as the Enuma Elish, which is a cuneiform tablet that speaks about our origin story and the devastation in our solar system long ago in the past. Found in 1849 in what is now the area of Mosul, Iraq, the Enuma Elish may be one of the most important pieces of writing in human history for the unaltered and extensive information given for the events of the ancient past. The Enuma Elish contains seven tablets, with the first five describing the turbulent celestial events that happened long ago when these Anunnaki royal gods acted out roles as the planets of our solar system like a grand play, with Marduk being represented as the planet X, known to the Sumerians as Nibiru, with Enlil represented as Jupiter. Reading from an excerpt from Tablet 6 of the Enuma Elish, it states, They bound him, holding him before Enki. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Enki, created mankind on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise Enki had created mankind and had imposed the service of the gods upon them, the task is beyond comprehension. The gods were then divided, all of the Anunnaki into upper and lower groups. He assigned 300 in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu and appointed them as guard. Enlil has always hated humanity and called them the beasts referencing their primitive nature and compared to their DNA. These brothers were given ownership and responsibility over planet Earth and deemed themselves gods of everything beneath them. Most of our story and the extensive conflict throughout humanity all stems from the jealousy that arose between Enlil and his sons over the gifts within the human genome that were instilled secretly by using Enki's own DNA himself. We learned in the Enuma Elish in Atrahasis that the Anunnaki created humanity to ease the workload of the Ajiji, the workforce of the royal family, and to jumpstart the genetics of the Neanderthal with their own DNA to toil in the Absu, which we know is South Africa. Today, thousands if not millions of ancient mining sites, dating to over 100,000 years old, utilizing advanced smelting techniques, have been found all over the region. This is the ancient reason why we still value gold nearly above all else, and is part of our long history of slavery on the planet. We are now just waking up to the truth of all of this. The original purpose behind the creation of Homo sapiens, through the eyes of Enlil, was to become a simple slave race, with only enough intelligence to comprehend basic orders. Even the idea of giving humans more intelligence through splicing their own Anunnaki DNA greatly angered Enlil, and he fiercely opposed it. Unbeknownst to Enlil, his half-brother Enki ended up secretly designing a model of Homo sapien that was far too intelligent and possessed large amounts of Anunnaki DNA that could even rival their greatness as a species. Enki felt great responsibility and compassion for his creation and endowed Homo sapiens with an advanced brain and higher consciousness with chakra centers of energy that could be manipulated from a distance in the future in case humanity became enslaved by ideas. When Enlil found out that Enki had given Homo sapiens 
the gifts of their intelligence, and the right to free will through conscious expansion. He was furious, and promised to enslave humanity forever, and never allow them to know the truth of who they really are. Much of the current reality stems from the promise that has always been kept and is the purpose behind the inversion of so many meanings that lead back to the truth, such as the demonization of the snake, Enki symbol. This realization of reality can be uncomfortable to accept, but necessary for growth and perspective. When Enlil was chosen to be the ruler of Earth, instead of his half-brother Enki, a promise that had been made for the ultimate slavery of humanity was orchestrated and carried out 12,800 years ago as the planet of crossing Planet X approached Perihelion and disaster occurred across the Earth, as told by Atrahasis, who was also known as Noah. This represented the great reset button of humanity, and just the calamity needed by Enlil to permanently enslave humanity by tricking them through the conditioning of certain ideas and laws, so that society would unknowingly give all of their energy away to these gods. The popular figure of the cross, represented by Planet X, meaning the crossing or the sacrifice on the crossing through Marduk's later trickery, was implemented into religion to become a massive control system of information in controlling the minds of all of society. A profound quote to explain this deception and control by Enlil, Ninurta, and Marduk on humanity comes from Barbara Marciniak, which states, The ultimate tyranny in a society is not controlled by martial law, but controlled by the psychological manipulation of consciousness, through which reality is defined so that those who exist within it do not even realize they are in prison. Underground cities such as Derinkuyu, Turkey provide startling evidence to show the immense work involved by past cultures to seek shelter during times of violent earth effects from Nibiru. These underground dwellings have been found all over the world and speak to a forgotten chapter of human history leading back to our current time today where most of this isn't even believed or known by society to be real. In 1991, Dr. Robert Harrington, the chief astronomer of the U.S. Naval Observatory, took an 8-inch telescope to the end of Black Birch, New Zealand, one of the few optimal viewing points on Earth, and discovered a large planetary body approaching our solar system. Dr. Harrington calculated this planetary body to be approaching from below the ecliptic at an angle of around 40 degrees. A year later, in 1992, NASA gave two press briefings where they prepared the public for disclosure of a new planet in the far outer reaches of our solar system they called Planet X. Millions followed the events, awaiting the spectacular announcement of a new planet, only to hear silence. Before Harrington could publish his findings, he mysteriously died of throat cancer, and his research was quickly debunked as simply mathematical inaccuracies. All information and stories about Planet X quickly disappeared and most forgot it even existed. Today, the Vatican Observatory continuously monitors the heavens from multiple telescopes awaiting the great return from heaven of the Anunnaki in Planet X. As we approach the fall of 2017, 3,600 years since the last crossing of Nibiru, the return and fulfilling of the prophecy of Revelation 12 seems imminent as events are unfolding across the world. As Planet X reaches perihelion near Earth, the changes we have been seeing will only increase in intensity. Great care must be followed by those living along coastal regions, especially those areas that are very low-lying and prone to flooding. Ocean levels will begin fluctuating dramatically during tidal phases, as well as increased earthquake and volcanic activity. Any large seismic activity could lead to a number of tsunamis along the coast and should be monitored closely. No matter what happens during this pass, records indicated will not be anywhere near as destructive as the past 12,800 years ago, which led to the end of the Ice Age and the Great Deluge. The biggest impacts from Planet X are likely not going to come from environmental disruptions, but from sweeping change across our social, monetary, political, religious, and scientific understandings. Reality as we know it will change forever once intelligent life is finally announced to the public. All of the silly distractions and ignorance that has plagued our world will melt away with astonishment and wonder once major discoveries in archaeology are revealed that lie under the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Sphinx, known as the Halls of Amente. Our understanding of who we are and our place within the multiverse is just beginning to be understood. This will be a time of weighing our consciousness and measuring our actions to reflect on what kind of being we are and how we can contribute to our timeline story. 
The Anunnaki gods followed the ancient rules laid down for the balancing of energy during zodiacal cycles. The time of Pisces featured a negative polarity, which is why we saw war dominate the planet for thousands of years. All of these changes represent the great metamorphosis of our time as we enter the positive polarity of Aquarius in the next several years to take the first step on our journey into the cosmos to join our galactic neighbors. What kind of society will we become? One focused on war and material gain by the eagle? or higher consciousness in the lost teachings of the great dragon Enki. Issues in my mind, especially the, the Genesis, book of Genesis, and, uh, and you're correct, the 12th planet was Sitchin's first book, and he did spend a lot of time showing you evidence, showing you evidence, showing you evidence. Here's this tablet. Look at this one, you know, and try, trying to make it. Uh, he was trying to justify this unbelievable theory that most of the scientific people and the academics were dissing him over because he was he was, you know, he was like a Wil Wilhelm Reich or uh, what was it? Uh, What's the guy's name? who discovered Troy. Uh, I can't remember his name. He was a German, though. But, you know, the same problem with him is the academics dissed him. And, uh, you know, so he was pretty much out on his own with his own resources. And so I, I, I kind of saw that with, uh, with Sitchin as well. And, you know, uh, Sitchin, uh, he left himself open, I think, by writing The Lost Book of Anki and not giving any sources for it. I think it was a great book. And, it, and I think it wove together a lot of the pieces that he had from various sources to tell the, the, the big story, which he did, did very well. He was a great writer. Uh, but I that never felt like I could reference that book without references, you know, so so I never really talk about that one. But uh, the 12th planet really opened my eyes to the Sumerian documents. And I'd been looking for a culture that had the earliest writing so I could kind of go back to the source and go, well, where did this technological chasm come between different civilizations? That's how I was approaching it. And uh, then I read, uh, I think, Genesis Revisited from him. And this really made me go back and read the Bible again closely. And I started seeing things from the perspective now, having read all the Sumerian documents, that made a lot more sense to me. And with that perspective, you could differentiate the truth from a lie a lot more readily. And so when you go back and read Genesis 1, and you see that they created that these gods, plural, created man in our image and our likeness. And then go read the Atrahasis account where a council meeting of the Anunnaki specified exactly that. And there, and I mean plural, there were six men and six women on this council. So, you know, you start seeing those kind of correlations as well once you've read the Sumerian documents, which predated the Bible by a very long time. All of a sudden you realize that... Uh, what you have there that's called the word of God isn't completely true. And there were political agendas in writing that book. If you truly understand the circumstances the Hebrew people were in as they were being held captive in Babylon, where they first saw <laughs> where they first saw these documents, these Sumerian documents. Okay. So, um, so what, so what do we know? Uh, what, what, what is your specific question about the prehistory of Nibiru, this planet that they say they come from? And then we can kind of walk from there into the main players and who did what to whom and how we ended up where we are now, but kind of will give us a platform to maybe discuss a little more. Great. Uh, you know, uh, correlations with uh, how we go forward. Cause that's, you know, once you realize all this stuff, it takes a long time to process it. And some people, some people, years. Okay, this is like, this is like tearing out every belief system you have, and all of a sudden you're faced with this truth that's in stone that's sitting up in museums where you can either ignore it, or synthesize it and realize what they were saying probably was not a lie, even though it was called a myth by <laughs> by the conquering cultures, right? Well, and here's one thing that I'd I'd like to make a point as far as different religions and cultures and beliefs. That's one of the amazing things about being a human being is we have the right to think for ourselves and believe what we want to. So, you know, whatever take or or mindset you have on religion, divine providence, God, if you believe in multiple gods, if you're an atheist, whatever, you know, this is tonight just an opportunity to hear about stuff that's been documented throughout history 
and the translations that are discussed have, you know, there, there's multiple sources that collaborate and say, yes, this is what happened. So whether or not you want to believe it or it's 100 percent accurate, you know, that's up for debate and that's fine for you to believe. But a lot of this information is it's it's cutting edge because this is stuff that's been suppressed for thousands of years um, when the Crusades took place and, you know, anything that wasn't a part of the system church at that time, you know, was looked at as blasphemy, witchcraft, and people were burned at the stake, libraries, and tons of information was destroyed because of this. So a lot of this information and what you're talking about predates the books of the Bible, and that's just incredible. So I would like to talk about the six women and the six men that were part of it, and we'll get into the, some of the names and the correlations of the biblical references, maybe the Greek gods, and maybe even if they connect to the, the Vedic gods, you know, Valahara and some of the, the Nordics and stuff. But my question was about Nibiru is the, uh, the official version that I know about of the Anunnaki when they came to Earth was to look for gold. Is that correct? Well, that is correct. Um, if we start back on the prehistory of Nibiru, uh, there was a king that ends up as the main progenitor in the Anunnaki line that we like to include in the story because he was head of the Anunnaki council and his name was Anu. Okay, so Anu okay. was the original king or the, as far back as you can go, it was Anu. Right, and we're circa 450,000 years ago right now. And according to their records, uh, one of the beings who was the prior king, his name was Lama, <coughs> excuse me, he, uh, he was discussing uh, problems in their atmosphere, whether to bolster their atmosphere to protect themselves against radiation using the volcanoes to reactivate them by firing missiles into them or to create a particulate solution to seed the atmosphere. And uh, this was a discussion they were having way, way back then. Because uh, you have to understand, in the in the um, myths of Mesopotamia, there's a document in there called the Atrahasis, written by Stephanie Dolly. And the, the document is, I'm sorry, the Enuma Elish. There's Atrahasis as well, but the Enuma Elish is the Babylonian or the Sumerian cosmogony, which essentially describes how our solar system came to be. And what, why it's important to them is because, according to the account, their planetary system, we call it the Nibiru constellation, all right? It looks like they have a mini sun and about seven planets total. And each planet may have a, a couple of a satellites. Okay. Well, anyway, this constellation somehow, according to their record, in this allegory of this epic battle in, in space with, think of the planets as billiard balls that are just flying around. Well, they're, they somehow got trapped into our sun's uh, orbit in a retrograde orbit, according to them, that uh, they weren't in before. And after the first time through, they described all the things they were doing at the inner planets to prepare themselves for shielding radiation, have to blow this up to get it out of the way, all these kind of things. And we didn't really understand it until we got a little more scientific, I think. They were talking about using weapons that could split an entire planet. You know, and, and that re that reminds me of like a type 2 civilization. Right. So... So anyway, they had atmospheric problems without getting too lost there. Uh, they're in a 3600 retrograde orbit, according to them. They kept time in that method, you, in what was called a char. Even the Sumerian kings list, their reigns were listed in shars. Okay? And if you if you read the Sumerian kings list that was given to us by Barossus, it, uh, it shows the first one having a, a reign of eight shars, which turns out to be 28,800 years, <laughs> as unbelievable as that is. And we'll, we'll get to that, okay? But... But keep that in mind. So they got trapped in this retrograde orbit. It gives them a, a platform, a moving platform, to see all the other planets that are already in this space. Well, they didn't get they didn't get out that easily. They apparently had some collisions about the second time around their their 3,600 year orbit, such that one of the satellites of the Buru struck um, a planet that was in the place where the Earth is now. They called it Tiamut. It broke uh, part of it off. Uh, Part of it became the Earth, and the other part became the asteroid belt. And at that point, one of the moons in Nibiru apparently got stuck in its orbit, and that's why. And they called that one Kingu, which is uh, our moon, which is unusually large for our planet. You have to admit. So anyway, so a lot of these stories they told in this Enuma Elish account, we are now verifying scientifically that what they said is true. And you know, this document is is quite old. 
So from that, from there, uh, they needed a solution because if you imagine a planetary system coming into perihelion with the sun every 3,600 years, what it would do to your atmosphere? It'd probably strip it of various uh, components that uh, would normally be there, either through magnetic effects, through plasma discharge, and irradiating it. Who knows? Okay, but apparently they had this need to keep bolstering their atmosphere, which you know, and I think. They knew in the long run it was a losing battle to continue to do this. They needed a long-term solution, and I think that's partly where the Earth came in <laughs> in their long-term plans. But anyway, they they had an, an occlusion account in their Numa Ilish with the Earth, so they knew about it, and they called the the planet Key. Okay, and they counted from the outside in from their from their perspective, since when they were out at Helion, they were the farthest planet out, so they counted inward of the planets inward, and that if you count that way, the Earth is number seven. That's why I named my second book, The Seventh Planet. Okay. So uh, with this problem that they had, they, the king, Anu, decided to dispatch his chief scientist, who was called Enki. It was his firstborn son. He was uh, sent to the Earth to do a couple of things. One of the primary things was to find resources to bolster the atmosphere back on the Buru as they were coming into perihelion with the sun again. So... Uh, some accounts show that he was looking in the Persian Gulf initially. That's where he splashed down and built the city of Eridu, which is right there where the Tigris and the Euphrates meet, running through the Sea of Reeds into the Persian Gulf. Okay. So that's, according to him, if he did that, when he said he did it, that city is 450,000 years old. And it's still sitting there in the desert in Iraq, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much uh, I don't know, like a pile of rubble. Jeez. Anyway, um, so that's pretty amazing. So he came... Uh, tried to get colloidal gold out of the oceans. Apparently, if it's already in a colloidal solution, or you can use chemicals to do it and derive it that way, you already got a powder-like form that you can uh, ionize in the atmosphere. It's very simple. Whereas, you know, if you take gold and have to smelt it somehow to get it to a, a powder form or a form that could be sprayed, think about how you would do that. Would you just make it little tiny particles that you'd spray up there? It'd be too heavy. It would just, it would just fall out of the atmosphere, right? So that'd be very, very small particles. So, uh, so that was about four hundred fifty thousand years ago. So, uh, Enki uh, was Enki means Lord of the Earth, by the way. So his initial title was Lord of the Earth. Um, his half brother Enlil uh, was still back on the Buru, and he was born of his father Anu and his half sister, Anu's half sister, whose name was Arash. Or her other name was Ki. She was, she was nicknamed Ki Arash. So. She uh, ended up giving birth to Enlil, and because she was a half-sister, and because of mitochondrial DNA contributions in the purity of their bloodline, he was in line to rule. Enki was not. So, um, at this point, we're in the Persian Gulf, and Enki's trying to get gold. He brought a small band of workers with him, which he called the Gigi. They also referred to him in the Book of Enoch as the Watchers. These were highly technical fellow gods that uh, generally ran spacecraft, low earth drones, uh, all kinds of technical things to watch the state of the simulator to report back to the higher ups, okay? Whether it was an asteroid coming in or too much radiation, just whatever, okay? That's partly why they were called the watchers. So they were, they were there uh, to assist Enki in getting this gold from the Persian Gulf. Apparently they didn't get it fast enough. 5,000 years elapsed. Uh, they ended up being vectored to South Africa where the Atrahasis document picks up. So, uh, at this point, um, apparently they weren't getting gold fast enough from the Persian Gulf, and they got vectored down to Africa where they could mine it more significantly. This is where the Atrahasis picks up. And in the beginning of this first tablet of the Atrahasis, it describes them casting lots you know, uh, to divide up the territories between some of the key players that we, we should lay out here. We've already mentioned Anu and Enki. Enlil was the other one. The one we didn't mention was the half-sister to both of them, whose name was Nin Hartzog. And later on, we'll find out her name was Isis in Egypt. She was the medical officer that accompanied them. She was very important because if, <coughs> if one of them had a child with her, it would be in line to rule because of this half-sister uh, mitochondrial DNA thing. So she was kind of a key player for that reason as well. Okay. So... Um, he, they end up casting lots. Enki gets Africa. Anu goes back to Nibiru. Enlil gets Mesopotamia. And the exemption is that the Temple of Eridu 
and the city that Enki built there with his original Ijiji watchers still belonged to him. But apparently he had a garden there, and he'd done all kinds of things in 5,000 years until his brother showed up. At this point, um, they've divided the territory. I left Inanna out. She got the Indus Valley. Okay, then Enki, Enki's in Africa. Oh, and, and the medical officer actually got some territory, even though she was a medical officer. She, uh, she got given the Bond Heaven Earth region up in the Sinai Peninsula that belonged to the Anunnaki. Now, this was the area where they had their, I guess you would call it their communication facilities. Okay. And also transport facilities for moving the ore back to Nibiru, whether it went directly or via a way station. I'm thinking of those in Peru or somewhere out there. They had those ginormous, like, uh, landing pads and very big, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, sculptures of different animals and stuff like that. Was that done by the Anunnaki? Like, was that to give them an idea from space? Um, it very well could have. Uh, there, there have been several races, I believe, that have visited the Earth and done prospecting here. And okay. I think there have been somewhat controversies between races of buying for those, uh, uh, you know, resources from the Earth. So, you know, resource wars and genetic wars, both. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's go back to Africa.